Put your hands together for Mr. Martin Amini! DC, what up? Hey, man, one more time for all the comics you saw tonight, man. Give it up for Benji, Paris, Ashley, and Dominic. This lineup looked like we were like a, a brochure for a community college. Like, it's just, <laughs> just all of us just stacked up together like endless possibilities. You know what I mean? Like, signed up for a course at Montgomery College, fall semester. That's how we, that's what we look like, you know what I mean? Man, man, shout out to everyone from Silver Spring, man, you know? This, you know, this is, that's where I'm from, man. Both my parents came to this country 35 years ago so they could pursue their dreams and hopefully give me an opportunity to chase my dreams, you know, so I can be up on stage and tell these dick jokes, feel me? <laughs> At this motherfucking bar or restaurant going under renovation, you know what I mean? <laughs> This shit, hey man, this shit is a dream come true though. You know, this is, this is what I always wanted. That would, if I have one message tonight, I said this at the last show, but this is real. Follow your fucking dreams, son. You know what I mean? Don't, don't settle for no basic shit. You know what I mean? Do, do what you want. If you had a job that you don't fuck with, yo, fuck that shit, son. Quit, drop your mix, drop your mixtape. You know what I mean? It's like, we all got that mixtape like, man, I'm gonna, wait till the streets hear this. You know what I mean? <laughs> they don't even know, son. Oh, shit, if I could do this shit, anyone else could do this shit, man. You just gotta be sad, you know what I mean? Hey. <laughs> yo, you live with your parents long enough, yo, you be telling jokes too on TV, you know what I mean? Hey, nothing's impossible, you know what I mean? Montgomery College, endless possibilities. Uh, yeah, I'm a, product of, I'm a product of Montgomery College, man. That's where all the jokes, are, that's where it happens, man. Are you guys chasing your dreams? Are y'all doing what y'all love to do? Okay, two people. Everyone else just sad as shit right now. Is that why we're at a comedy show right now? Like, I haven't felt anything in days. Please, Martin, lift my spirits. I need something. There's a void. Fill it. Fill it with laughter. I get it, man. You know, 2018, it's a popular time to be sad, man. You know? this, is, this is the year of sad. If you're going to be sad, this is the year to be sad, man. I made it a point this year to be happy. I bought a whiteboard and everything. I said, focus on being happy. I wrote that shit down, you know? But the older I get, the more I realize, yo, it's hard as shit to be happy. Can't watch the news no more. That shit's always sad. Can't listen to Drake no more. Drake's always sad. Drake's always complaining about women not loving him back. I'm like, dog, I live with my parents. What the fuck am I supposed to do, son? That's why I only listen to Jay-Z when I'm sad, because Jay-Z is a motivator. Jay-Z overcame adversity. Jay-Z used to sell crap cocaine in the Brooklyn projects. Then he rose to fame and married Beyonce, all while being ugly as shit. I'm like, yo, that's amazing. He overcame poverty and he overcame looking like a camel. That's my hero, son. That's my fucking hero. That's who I want to be like, you know? Jay-Z got me through some tough times growing up, man. I remember I got my first job when I was 15 years old working at the Wheaton Plaza Movie Theater. Yeah, shout out to that ghetto-ass theater. Back then it was kind of hood. I knew it was kind of hood because the people used to have sex in the movie theaters and it was my job to let them know that they couldn't do that. <laughs> this is real, son. I remember I walked in my first day of work, I walked in and you know, my boss was like, hey Mar, we got a situation in theater number 10, I need to go handle that. You know, I was 15, I was a virgin at that point, so I was like, this might be educational, you know what I mean? So, I walked in, I was excited and nervous at the same time. I was like, I was like, hey yo, y'all can't do that in here. And they just looked at me like, what the fuck are you gonna do about it? And I was like, nothing. <laughs> Please don't make a mess, you know what I mean? I'm sad as shit, I listen to Jay-Z, man, you know? That's, that's how I grew up, man, I grew up sad, you know? That's how you become a comic, man. You just have some, like, the right recipe of sadness and you just end up on stage talking to strangers. I swear, man, that shit, ain't nothing to it, really. Anyone can do this. I, uh, just gotta be sad. I, uh, now I grew up, you know, things a lot has changed, man, since then, you know. I just recently found out my aunt is a Trump supporter, which, uh, that shit caught me off guard. At this point, I think it's just my aunt and Kanye West that fuck with Trump, because, like, this shit... <laughs> what threw me off is because my aunt's from Bolivia, you know what I mean? And we're like, you know, shout out to my Bolivian cousins in the room. <laughs> 
You know, finding out my aunt is a Trump supporter is like finding out my best friend has herpes, you know? Because my first reaction is like, ugh. But my, <laughs> but my second reaction is like, I probably can't go over her house no more. <laughs> but I wanted to have like an open dialogue with my Tia Delia. I was like, yo, Tia Delia, man, why, why would you support Donald Trump? He's like, yo, honestly, I just don't want my family to visit. I was like, yo. <laughs> That's the realest shit I ever heard in my life, son. <laughs> Speak your truth, queen. <laughs> That's real, man. Honest, look, I'll, I'll keep it 100 with you guys, man. Prior to the elections, like, you know, I always thought Republicans were cool, man, for real. Like, I was never Republican, but I was saving up money to become a Republican, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, 100. Who doesn't want to be a rich white guy in America, son? I love sailing, son. You know, started doing my research on Republicans, man. I started listening to the Ben Shapiro podcast. I don't know if you, I don't, I don't know if you guys fuck with or no Ben Ben Shapiro. For those who don't know, he's like the new face of the Republican Party. You know what I mean? And I think it's important to listen to other media outlets to understand what the other argument is. Sometimes, you know, what I mean, we get caught up in our own narrative. We don't know what the other side's talking about. But after listening to Ben Shapiro for like five minutes, I'm like, he's giving off some small dick energy right now. I, uh, <laughs> you know, what I mean, I, I'm. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Small Dick Energy. This guy's like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about right now, son. He ain't, he ain't even looking at me right now. He ain't even like, I don't know what that shit is, son. Big Dick Energy all day. Hell yeah, dog. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> Front row, Big Dick Energy. Ah, I don't give a fuck. That's real, man, you know? That big dick energy is real, man. That's it. <laughs> That's how you start wearing orange shirts at fucking comedy shows. Like, fuck it. Big dick energy. Let's go. I'm fucking sponsored by Starburst. Let's go. Let's do this shit. <laughs> man, man. But my fucking... The news is... News is fucking me up, man. A lot of it has to do with the fact that... uh. I'm a child of immigrants, you know, and uh, it's hard to avoid or escape the fact that there's a lot of negative, you know, images and stuff being displayed on the news constantly, man, you know, and it, it got to the point where, like, you know, I, and I tried to do my part, you know, post high quality memes on Facebook to let the streets know what's going on, you know what I mean, woke ass videos, that's me, I'm that guy. But it got to the point where my cousins in Bolivia were concerned about me because I always look sad as shit on Facebook, man, they hit me up like, primo! It's time to go back to Bolivia and be with your family. And I'm just like, nah. <laughs> I'm good, bro. You wearing Dennis Robbins. I'm wearing Jordans right now, son. You step your game up, Mauricio, you know? <laughs> Fucking Jordans, man. I learned the power. Yo, I grew up wearing Jordans, man. That's you guys, I don't know if you guys under, understand the cultural significance of having Jordans at a young age, especially growing up in a working class neighborhood. That shit was power, man. Like, Jordans in the 90s, that was like our Bitcoin. You know what I mean? That shit was like cryptocurrency, son. For real. Trade that shit on the black market, you know what I mean? I didn't know the significance of Jordan until I turned 10 years old. I was in fourth grade. My mom bought me my first pair. It was a Jordan 12s. It was a special day in my life. Didn't realize how important it was until I put them on and I wore them to school. I got to school and they're like, oh shit, look at motherfucking Martin with them Jordans on. And I'm like, yo, why is my math teacher so excited right now? You know what I mean? Like, what the fuck? He's never paid attention to me before. I need to wear Jordans every day. And it's crazy because like up until then, I, w I thought I was very fashionable. I'd wear like Tommy Hilfiger, I'd wear guest jeans all the time. I had a bully, you know what I mean? Like, he saw me wearing guests and he was like, guess who's gay? And I was like, my friend's like, yo, we called you gay, dog. It's over. <laughs> Stand down. <laughs> I'll always be like, I'm not gay. They're like, have you kissed a girl yet? I was like, no. Do you sleep over your friend's house every weekend? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Sounds pretty gay to me, bro. <laughs> I was like, I just like playing GoldenEye. Leave me alone, son. <laughs> yeah, man. Fucking... My bully's name was Dante. I call him bitch-ass Dante now that I'm adult, you know what I mean? You know, because Dante used to make fun of me every, every day when I was in elementary school. Mainly, it was the worst time for me was Halloween, because when I was, for Halloween, I was Aladdin every year. And, uh, <laughs> fuck you guys, man. Like, you know, 
I, I know it doesn't take a lot for me to look like Aladdin. It was just me going to school with no shirt on asking for bread for three years. It was just, which way is Agrabah? You know what I mean? It got to the point where my, you know, I, I, was, I was getting fucked up. Dante was fucking hurting my feelings. So I had to go, I had to talk to my mom. Like, yo, mom, I can't be allowed no more. She's like, all right, so what you want to be? I was like, I want to be Captain Planet. That's cool. You know, back in the day, I don't know if you guys remember Captain Planet. Captain Planet, you know, in the 90s, he was the shit. He used to save the planet, you know what I mean? But my mom, she's from Bolivia. She's never seen Captain Planet on TV. So she tried to mimic what the, you know, what the costume was on TV then, but I ended up looking like a cool ass Smurf. You know what I mean? Like that shit. <laughs> That's when I realized she doesn't care if I get bullied or not. You know what I mean? I was like, fuck, man. So now I'm in the Halloween parade. It's fourth grade. I don't know if you guys remember the Halloween parade, but the stakes are very high. It's like the Super Bowl for kids, right? It's going to determine your social status leading up until middle school, you know? So I was just, you know, I was nervous, you know, dressed like a Smurf, and I just was in this Halloween parade. And everyone had some cool-ass costumes like X-Men and Power Rangers, and it was me. And then Dante saw me, and he just pointed me out in front of everybody. He was like, oh, what are you supposed to be, a Captain Planet or Captain Food Stamps? I can't tell. I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah, that's fucked up, you know? But I tried to flip it on him. I was like, yeah, you know what, Dante? I am Captain Food Stamps. Keep talking trash. I'm gonna cut you and your whole family off. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yo. <laughs> yo, he didn't fuck with me after that, yo. This shit. That was my world star moment, you know what I mean? But that's how I grew up, man. Me and Dante, we ended up becoming friends. And the, uh, to be honest, where I grew up, making fun of each other is how we became friends. That's like, that's some shit that we, you know, we lost sight of in 2018. We can't say shit to nobody no more, man. Everyone's offended and shit. How are we supposed to become friends? If I can't make fun of this guy for having big dick energy, you know what I mean? Like, who knows? We might have some fun after this. I don't know. We might hit the town. I don't know what the fuck we might do. You know what I mean? Rainbow shirt and big dick energy. <laughs> we could take over DuPont. <laughs> I'm like the new mayor of DuPont after this show, wearing this shirt. Ah, oh, man. That's funny. But you know, everyone now, you know, what I was gonna say about that area where I grew up in, which honestly, looking around, a lot of y'all could probably relate to this shit. We all grew up in a neighborhood, yo, diverse as shit, son. Very lucky to grow up in Silver Spring. Very lucky to do comedy in D.C. D.C. is the most open-minded liberal city in the world. I, for real, this is real shit. I took that shit, I, I, I feel like I take that shit for granted. Cause you know, now I travel for comedy, do shows all across the country, and I'm realizing, yo, that shit ain't like this out here in Silver Spring. You know, this shit is different, son. This is how I feel. The further I go down I-95 I South, the more I'm afraid to see the American flag. Now hear me out. If I see a Confederate flag and a Cracker Barrel, I know I'm in the wrong place, right? But if I see an American flag, I'm like, I don't know, you know what I mean? Let me just keep driving because I don't want to find out. This is, what I, this is how I feel, man, because you know, sometimes, you know, I don't got a job, so I reflect, smoke some weed, and I was thinking, <laughs> if our country went to war, like, this week, would I fight for my country? And I was thinking about it, you know? I'd fight for Maryland, D.C., <laughs> and parts of Virginia. <laughs> But I don't fuck with Gainesville, Virginia like that, you know what I mean? They can fight for themselves, man. Racist motherfuckers, you know what I mean? This is what happened to me in Gainesville. I did a show out there probably like a year and a half ago. Owed some parking tickets, so I said, fuck it. I'll go to Gainesville do a show, you know? I had some time before the show, so I hit up a local Gainesville Starbucks, you know what I mean? I wanted to get my caramel macchiato fixed. That's my shit. Got the macchiato, it didn't taste that good, so I returned it. I was like, hey, this don't taste macchiato-ish. The lady was like, yo, if you don't like it, why don't you go back to where you came from? And I was like, oh, you want me to go back to Silver Spring, Maryland? What the fuck are you talking about right now? I guess what she was implying was for me to go back to Iran, right? A country that I've never been to or even speak the language. Gotta be honest with you guys, yo, I got more in common with a 30-year-old white woman than I do with a guy who lives in Iran. So, I did what any white woman would do in that situation. <laughs> I asked to speak with the supervisor. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't hate me for where I'm from. Hate me because I will get you fired. You know what I mean? I am a threat. I will email someone about this. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> ah, my friends. People mad at Trump? I get it. You know? It's fucking up. But I know one person happy as shit with Trump, besides Kanye. Not Kanye. George W. Bush. Yeah, y'all remember that fucking shithead? Yo, George W. Bush got called stupid for eight years. I don't care who you are, that shit hurts your feelings, son. <laughs> then Donald Trump got elected and he's like, who's stupid now, you know what I mean? <laughs> when George W. got elected for the first time, I was in eighth grade, I was in Mr. Jones' class. Yo, Mr. Jones be like, oh, he used to talk shit. He's like, oh, we just gonna elect a cokehead to be president? I was like, yo, Mr. Jones, didn't you vote for Marion Barry? He smoked crack cocaine. He's like, nah, it's a difference. Marion Barry is a member of the community and he smokes the drugs of the community. <laughs> I was like, true, 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 true. Now I'm, woke, now I'm all woke and shit, you know? I do woke things. I go to protests. I never thought I was gonna be a protest head, you know what I mean? Until two years ago, I started going to protest. I learned a lot about protest. I learned you gotta be very selective of who you go to protest with. I learned I can't go to protest with my white friends because my white friends are too confident in protest. They <laughs> yell at police officers. I'm not into that shit, man. I was at a protest with my friend, Matt. He just started yelling out, I don't care if I get arrested. You could take me to jail. I was like, ooh, you're on your own that one, Matt. Uh, <laughs> Cause you like, get some job security that I don't got, dog. You know. <laughs> I got asked to perform at a protest a year ago, uh, for the first time, and probably my last time. Uh, I got paid a lot, but I was like, you know, fuck it, I'll do it. I was nervous. I showed up, nervous as shit. The lady knew I was nervous, so she's like, listen, ma, I know you, I know you're nervous, but I want to let you, I want to let you know, you're perfect for this event. You're Iranian, you're Bolivian, and you're gay. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> the fuck you talking about? I know I'm wearing a rainbow shirt, but that shit don't mean I'm gay, son. And she's like, you're not gay? I'm like, no. She's like, well, you're almost perfect. I was like, what does that even mean? So, like, yo, there's no time to explain. You're next. I was like, Fuck. So now I'm on stage for 2,000 people and shit, and they're all fighting for gay rights. <laughs> and I was on stage like, you guys ready for comedy? They were like, no. <laughs> I was like, true, true, true. I was trying to be relatable and shit. I was like, man, don't y'all hate it when you go to Walgreens and run out of poster board and markers? They didn't think that shit was funny at all. I started getting booed immediately. Dude from the front was like, boo! This is no funny! Boo! This is no funny! I was like, yo, why the fuck is my uncle heckling me right now? What the fuck, son? It's fucked up. <laughs> and now I'm at this stage in my life, I'm 31, I'm like growing. You know, I'm at that stage where like half my friends are settling down, they're getting married. Other half of my friends are trying to get me to invest in the weed edible startup company. <laughs> they're like, hey dog, for $5,000, we can make this happen. I'm like, bro, if I had $5,000, I wouldn't be at Costco eating samples with you right now. Why would you even suggest that shit, dog? We're roommates off Craigslist. We don't even have $5,000. What the fuck you talking about right now, man? You know, just like everyone else in the 30s, I'm trying to get in better shape, man. Recently got a personal trainer. I learned personal trainers are only valuable if they're in better shape than you, you know? <laughs> if they're not, don't fuck with them. Learn that shit the hard way, man. I had a guy, his name was Gary. When I met Gary, I felt like I was going through a midlife crisis because he was sad and overweight. This is real. I met him at LA Fitness and he walked in. He's like, hey, Martin, are you ready to do this? I'm like, Gary, are you ready to do this, dog? You look sad as shit right now, and you have a Dorito stain on your shirt, bro. What the fuck? Now I gotta motivate Gary. I'm like, come on, Gary, we got these. He's like, okay. I got this overweight guy trying to motivate me like he's DJ Khaled. Like, we the best. I'm like, no, Gary, you're fat, bro. Help yourself. But Gary was trying to motivate me, you know what I mean? He had me doing pull-ups. So, you know, I was doing pull-ups and he was motivating me and I was struggling. So in that moment, Gary put his hands on my waist and lifted me, right? Now, I don't know if any guy here has been lifted by the waist before, <laughs> but I felt majestic as fuck, right? Yo, I felt like I won an NBA champion. Like, hell yeah, Gary, we did that shit. Ah! <laughs> A lot of guys don't like laughing at that joke because that's, that's their me too moment. They're like, nah, dog. <laughs> Only you get lifted by the waist, not me. I'm strong as shit. Big dick energy. Never forget that. I get it, man. I get it. You know? 
And listen, I don't got any jokes about the Me Too movement. I think that's a very serious issue. And I think all men need to be held accountable for their actions. Yes, yes, give it up. Especially my favorite rappers from the early 2000s, you know? That's right, I grew up in a generation where my favorite rappers was a rap group named No Limit. There's a guy named Master P, another rapper named Mystical, another rapper named C Murder, all right? Now, I don't know if you guys remember Mystical, but back in the day, and Silk the Shocker. Uh, that's right, one guy just like, one white guy's like, Silk the Shocker. <laughs> don't forget. <laughs> Hip-hop facts. <laughs> For the rule of three in comedy, it's three rappers. So, Mystical. Mystical had a song back in the day, I don't know if you guys remember, a song called Shake That Ass, but watch yourself, right? Second part, very important. Uh, <laughs> If you don't remember this song, I'll remind you the opening lyrics of the song. The opening lyrics of the song was, I walked in the club with my dick in my hand. I'm like, yo, that's a problem, Mr. Cole. <laughs> you can't start off a song like that and expect no questions to be asked, dog. You're on probation for sexual harassment. What the fuck you talking about? But he was in a rap group with a guy named C Murder, who's actually in jail right now. You guys know for what? Murder. Fucking murder. That's right, son. They didn't give a fuck in the early 2000s, son. I just pictured Master P having a team meeting, like, all right, y'all, listen up. I know we're called No Limit, but maybe we should have some fucking limits. Stop pulling your dick out, Mystical, it's a problem. But that was my generation, man. You know, like Don was talking, you know, I grew up on Juvenile. I grew up, Juvenile was my favorite rapper for like two months, you know? <laughs> He had a song called Back That Ass Up. That shit was a classic, son, you know? But that song in 2018, that shit would never survive. That's a problematic title, Back That Ass Up. We couldn't have that now. We'd have to be like, Back That Ass Up, if you want to. I'm here for you emotionally. Uh, if you want to go to college, yo, I will back that ass up, you know what I mean? That's me. That song is nostalgic. That shit, when I heard Back That Ass, I was 14, man. It's a great song of my life, because it's the first time I got twerked on. When you're 14, listen, when you get getting twerked on at the age of 14, that's like, that's all you want as a kid, you know what I mean? But now I'm 31, if a woman twerks on me now, I'm like, this isn't appropriate, you know what I mean? We're at an office party right now, I ain't trying to get called into HR the next day like, Martin, have a seat. Uh, we saw you with Karen from accounting last night on Facebook Live, and um, that's not the culture to promote here at Panera Bread. So let's just... Stick with the paninis and keep this shit moving, son. Yeah. I know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people here with parents from other countries and shit. That's dope. Yeah. That shit is, hey man, this shit is, we are in the mecca of that shit, man. This shit, this shit is powerful, you know? I'm proud. Half Bolivian, half Iranian. Shit's amazing. Yeah. That shit is. Daily Show needs to hire me, man. I don't know what the fuck. It's just taking forever. I don't know what the fuck's taking so long, you know what I mean? I'm the American dream, man. But when people, when, when I, when people here in D.C. find out, like, I'm, I'm half Iranian and half Bolivian, they're like, yo, how the fuck does that even happen, son? And I'm just like, my parents, fuck. That's what happens. They're like, wow, that's amazing. Which side do you identify with more, your Iranian side or your Bolivian side? I'm like, well, depends on what Donald Trump's talking about this week because... That shit can go either way, man. Let's be honest, because if you're talking about the Muslim ban, yo, I'm Bolivian as fuck. But if you're talking about building a wall, I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland. <laughs> Leave me the fuck alone, man. Now, I knew shit was bad last year when they, when they announced the Muslim ban. That shit was scary. Mainly because my dad was actually in Iran when they announced it. I remember my dad hitting me up on Facebook the next day like, son, what are we going to do? And I'm like, what are we going to do? <laughs> Shit, I'm gonna ride this out the next four years and wear cardigans and try to blend in, dog. Uh, you need to stop messing me on Facebook because this relationship is over, son. It is a wrap. My dad's a good dude, you know what I mean? He, he got back in the country safely, don't worry, you know what I mean? My dad, he did change his name to Fred, though. You know what I mean? My dad, my dad's name is Foruz Amini. He's like, you can call me Fred now. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, you look like Borat. You're not fooling anybody, dog. You hairy as shit, son. My dad is hairy. He's got to pluck his eyebrows twice before he's at the airport because you can't have a unibrow and be Iranian and expect not to be suspicious at the airport because even if you smile with a unibrow, you just look like a happy guy who's plotting at that point. Like, I'm here to go back to my country. Like, now nah, you're going to jail, son. <laughs> this is bullshit. <laughs> 
My dad's a good dude, man. My dad owns and operates eight ice cream trucks in Potomac, Maryland. Yeah. We, yeah, we, we, we got the streets on lock, you know what I mean? Don't come to Potomac, we'll fuck you up, man. That shit is real. Clap your hands if you grew up with the ice cream truck in your neighborhood. Clap your hands, yeah. Now, nah, couple dudes. Okay. Now, clap your hands if you had weapons, if you knew they had weapons hidden behind the freezer. Did y'all know that shit? Yeah, y'all didn't know that shit, huh? It's a, it's a violent business, man. For real. I grew up watching my dad beef with other ice cream truck drivers. Yeah. You know? And I think that's why I do comedy, because like once you see your dad getting knocked out over snow cone sales, you're going to end up headlining the DC Comedy Lab, son. <laughs> uh, that was too honest. I, um, I mean, that's just my family business, man. I, I'll be honest with you guys. You know, we're all friends now. You know, we're all Facebook buddies and Instagram and whatever. I drive an ice cream truck at the moment, you know what I mean? Killing the game. You know, and I actually got beef right now, currently, with a hot dog vendor in Rockville, Maryland. You know what I mean, his name is Mo. I call him bitch ass Mo. <laughs> Fuck him and his weak ass hot dogs. <laughs> this is how the beef started, because it hasn't even been settled yet. This is some ongoing shit that started in the early spring of this year. I was pulling up to one of my hot spots in Rockville, Julius West Middle School. You know what I mean? It was a, it was a sunny day. 75 degrees, perfect for snow cones. I pulled in, got my spot. Got my spot, then Mo pulls in with his hot dog cart, which is fine. I've known Mo for years. We've gone head to head for many years. But this particular day, as I was buying a hot dog for Mo, I noticed he added a snow cone machine to his cart. That's right. Therefore breaking, that's right, fuck Mo. Thank you, one person. That's right. That, that, shit, that shit got to that guy's core. He, he was like, snow cone, what? I had to confront him. I was like, yo, what the fuck, Mo? You, you selling snow cones now? He's like, yeah, we gonna have a problem. I was like, yeah, you fucking right, we gonna have a problem. I couldn't say that because there's little kids around, so what I really said was, I'm gonna call my dad, right? <laughs> now all the kids are going, oh, shit. He's about to call his dad. So I get my dad on the phone. He's at home taking a nap. I'm like, yo, dad, you better get down here before I fuck up Mo. He's like, what? You want to fuck Mo? What? I'm like, no, man, he's selling snow cones now. He's like, I'm gonna fuck him, too. I'm like, nobody's fucking Mo, Dad! Pluck your eyebrows! <laughs> so now my dad, he pulls up in an ice cream truck, and he's got eight other ice cream trucks with him, because all my uncles, they drive ice cream trucks and shit. Angry as shit, playing the music all loud and shit. Dee-dee-ding, ding-ding, dee-dee-dee-dee-ding, dee-dee-ding, ding-ding, dee-dee-ding, ding-ding. The worst song to play before you're gonna fight another man, you know what I mean? You want to hear some gangster shit, not some ding 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 So now they're surrounding Mo, playing the music and shit. Mo, he doesn't know what to do. So he calls the cops, right? So now it's two cop cars. It's eight ice cream trucks. It looks like a Wu-Tang Clan music video. It's like, pop, pop. I don't know what's about to happen, man. That's how I grew up, man. I grew up fucking, my first car was an ice cream truck, you know what I mean? That's real, yeah. You know? Turn 16, my dad was like, well, if we won't buy you a car, we might as well make a profit. You know I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Now, I'm very lucky, man. My, I'm very fortunate to have supportive parents. Because most comedians, to be honest, they don't have supportive parents. I do. Mainly because before I got into comedy, I was a drug dealer. So <laughs> when I told them I was going to be a stand-up comedian, they're like, finally. He's getting his life together. <laughs> Go make us proud, son, with your dick jokes. Go. You know? Reflecting on, you know, what I put my parents through kind of messes me up sometimes. I remember when I, I was ninth grade, I got caught selling weed, and my mom was devastated. So she transferred to rich private school, thinking I was gonna help the situation. But in reality, she gave me a promotion. <laughs> I was like, thank you, mom. My profit just doubled. Shout out to Bethesda, I'm out here, yeah. <laughs> Private school changed my life, man. That shit exposed me to all different types of drugs, for real. You know, I remember getting invited to my first private school party. I was so excited. I was in the basement of this party. And I saw this kid, Trevor, with a mountain of cocaine, taking that shit to the head. He looked at me, he's like, hey, bro, you want in on this? I was like, nah, dude, I'm good. 
Ran off scared. I was going to judge the kid, but that same kid ended up being a very successful lawyer in downtown D.C. 10 years later. That's why now when people pull out cocaine, I'm like, well, let's see where this goes. <laughs> there might be some job opportunities at this guy's office. Shit. He might want to have me on LinkedIn. Who am I to judge? I, was, I always thought I was a good drug dealer up until I got held at gunpoint. That shit. When someone puts a gun in your face, I'm like, Jay-Z makes it sound cooler. You know what I mean? Like, what the fuck? I remember, man, it was my, I, was, I was, I think I was 16, first time I got robbed, got held at gunpoint. At the time, my best friend was a guy named Jacob Greenberg, another guy named Brandon Friedman. On this particular day, Jacob decided he wanted to drive me while I was making deals. So Jacob's in the front seat, I'm in the back seat, you know? Dude pulls up to the window, he's like, yo, you got the stuff? I was like, yeah, I got the stuff. You got the money? He's like, yeah, I got the money. So I showed him the stuff, then he showed me his gun. So in that moment, I just yelled out, hey, yo, dip out, dip out. And that's when Jacob just ran out the car. <laughs> now I'm just there to the do with the gun. He's like, yo, dog, you need some new friends, bro. <laughs> I'm like, I know, man. Take my shit, son. <laughs> that's a true story, man. I kept dealing. This is, this, this is a story I've never told before, man. I turned 16, got held at gunpoint, kept doing it. Age of 16, I bought 10 pounds of weed. Half of it paid for, other half not paid for. I decided to keep it in my trunk, because why? I was 16, I didn't want my mom to find it. <laughs> One day I'm waking up, going to school, car window's broken, trunk's open, all 10 pounds gone. So now I owe my drug dealers $15,000. Yeah, exactly. I didn't know what to do, I had no options. So in that particular day, you know, the only thing I could do at that point was go talk to my father, who as you guys know, drives an ice cream truck. So the chance of me getting $15,000, very slim. <laughs> so I went, approached my dad. I was like, yo, dad, I gotta talk to you. He's like, what is it? I was like, I need $15,000. <laughs> said, what the fuck did you just say? I said, I owe some drug dealers $15,000. Can you help me out? He's like, do you know how many cookie sandwiches I have to sell <laughs> to get you $15,000? I'm like, no, but I just need the money. So if you can give it to me, He's like, no, nah, I'm not gonna give it to you. I'll tell you what, give me their number, and I'm gonna pull up on them. I was like, I don't think that's a good idea, Dad. <laughs> you drive an ice cream truck. Let's be real on your lifestyle. But that's what he did. I didn't have an option. Gave him the number, he pulled up on them. They settled it. To this day, don't know what they said. All I know is the next day, drug dealers called me, and was like, yo, that's clear, you're good. And when I went to talk to my dad about it, I was like, yo, dad, how'd you get him to settle the debt? He's like, do you know how many cookie sandwiches I had to give him? <laughs> he's like, nobody ever refuses money and ice cream. I was like, hey, man, that's what's up. He's like, no, nah, he's a good dad, man. Now nah, he got me out of that situation. And for that, I'm grateful, you know? Unfortunately, I kept dealing. <laughs> I wish I could say, like, I stopped after that, but people don't know this about drug dealing. Yo, that shit is more addicting than fucking doing drugs, man. Because once you make in two, three thousand dollars in high school, you're like, I like wearing Jordans, you know what I mean? So, at that point, I was dropping 400 on throwback jerseys back when that phase was stupid phase. I, uh, I remember, man, I remember I turned 16, seven, I was 17, senior year in high school, get caught with an ounce of weed, which isn't a lot compared to 10 pounds, but in Montgomery County in 2004, they used to arrest you for shit like that, put you in jail. It's my first time in jail. Very scary experience. Mainly because they put me in a jail cell with three gangster Latino guys. And I knew these guys were like real gangsters for real because they were wearing red shirts, they had khaki pants, and they didn't look like they worked for Target, you feel me? And, uh, <laughs> and they were speaking Spanish sizing me up because I couldn't tell where I was from. Finally, one of the dudes walked up and was like, hey, bro, where you from? I didn't want to say the wrong thing. I was like, oh, me? I'm from Bolivia. <laughs> He's like, for serious, bro? Es la verdad? And I was like, yes. <laughs> and they were like, okay. And I'm like, yo, did I just join a Latin gang? What the fuck? That shit was tense. Because I could tell they didn't really believe me all the way. So I tried to break the tension by saying every Spanish word I learned in eighth grade. I was like, listen. We need to stick together. Nosotros necesitamos. Vamos a la biblioteca. 
They just looked at me like, what the fuck, bro? You think we're stupid, huh? Why do you throw a library? I said, because, bro, we might be locked up, but they can't lock out a cabeza. They're like, you're crazy, bro. But we like you. We're gonna call you el pollo loco. I was like, hell yeah, that's my favorite chicken spot, dog, you know what I mean? <laughs> Listen, man, you guys are an amazing audience, man. You guys are fucking fantastic, man. God bless you all. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate you guys, man. Thank you. Uh, this is my first time my dad's come to the show, so I just want to bring my dad on stage with my mom. Yo, come on. So this is my dad. So all, you know, every for, for those if this is a, if this is not your first time, you know the stories about the ice cream truck. My dad was the man of the night. He might not be scary right now. He's cute as shit right now. But, <laughs> but back in the '90s, he used to fuck up ice cream truck drivers. Man, this is real, man. This is my life. You know what I mean? Look at my mom. My mom's always been adorable. Look at her. Give it up for my mom. Man. This is the American dream, man. <laughs> 